On Point with Craig's Investment Partners. The information provided here is general in nature. It's not financial advice. It doesn't take into account your financial situation, objectives, goals or risk tolerance. All investments are subject to risks and none are guaranteed. So before you make any investment decisions, we recommend you contact an investment advisor. For more information about our services in that regard, you can go to our website, which is craigsip.com. Welcome to On Point. I'm Mark Lister, Investment Director at Craig's Investment Partners, and I'll be talking about a range of topics, including economics, portfolio strategy, investor education, and anything else that's happening out there in financial markets. It's been a pivotal month in US politics. We've seen plenty of action since that now infamous June debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Biden has stepped aside and current Vice President Kamala Harris is all but assured to be the Democratic nominee. This will all become official at the Democratic Convention in a few weeks' time, if not earlier, and by then we should also know who she'll be running with. You would think that Harris will opt for someone who'll win votes from areas that she might not be naturally as strong. You'd think it'll be someone more moderate, someone probably from a swing state, and in all likelihood, a white male. Some of the names that have been thrown around as key contenders are Josh Shapiro from Pennsylvania, Andy Bashir from Kentucky, Roy Cooper from North Carolina, and also Mark Kelly from Arizona. Quite a good chance it'll be one of those four. The Rust Belt states will be incredibly important this election, as they have been in the last two, and that part of the US is likely to decide the outcome too. Hillary Clinton lost the Rust Belt in 2016, before Biden won it back in 2020. Harris will be very conscious of that, and she will want to pick a running mate that is strong in that part of the country. So should we expect Harris's campaign to be particularly different to Joe Biden's? No, we shouldn't. Harris will be very similar in terms of her thinking and her outlook. Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, obviously from very different generations and from very different parts of the United States, but they are both loyal Democrats who will take their cues from the party, in sharp contrast to Donald Trump. So what have the odds done since Biden stepped aside? Well, before that fateful June debate, the betting odds were pointing to a narrow Trump victory, but it was expected to be close. The odds then moved in Trump's favour after that very poor performance from Joe Biden, and then they surged even further following that failed assassination attempt on Donald Trump in mid-July. So since Biden stepped aside, that trend has reversed, and we're almost back to where we started before that June debate. So most polls do suggest Trump still has the edge, but it does look like it will be close, as was the case a month or two back. And I think that's why you've seen some of those so-called Trump trades reverse across financial markets. If you look back over the last three or four weeks, small companies in the US have done very well. Those companies tend to be more domestically focused and bigger beneficiaries of any potential tax cuts that you might see under a Republican president and a Republican Congress. So that sort of trade was one that was working for investors when Trump was going up in the polls and with the odds rising, small cap stocks doing very well, and we've seen that reverse a little bit. We also saw a steeper yield curve as one of those Trump trades, and that means that longer term market interest rates have increased relative to shorter term interest rates. And that could be due to the market seeing weaker growth prospects, maybe due to more tariffs, which would obviously push short term interest rates down or greater long-term uncertainty around the growth outlook, around inflation, around bond supply, because you've got higher US deficits. All of those things could potentially push longer term Treasury yields higher. So that has reversed slightly since we've seen Biden step aside and Harris come into the mix and those odds even up a little bit. The other big news we've seen lately is that the Republican camp has confirmed that Ohio Senator J.D. Vance will be Trump's running mate. Vance turns 40 just this week, and that would make him, if successful, the youngest vice president since Richard Nixon in 1952. You'd also expect him to be more active than most vice presidents. He shares many of Donald Trump's views on America first, on more tariffs, 
and on additional curbs on immigration. A lot of those things could help domestic businesses that are exposed to the US rather than multinationals that are exposed to the rest of the world, but it could also fuel more inflation. That might put upward pressure on interest rates, as would the higher deficit that many are expecting. Ironically, under that scenario, the US dollar might actually find itself supported, despite hopes from Trump that it will weaken and increase the competitiveness of American manufacturers. Like Trump, Vance is pro-business, but it might not all be plain sailing. Earlier this year, J.D. Vance sponsored a bill with a Democratic senator called the Stop Subsidising Giant Mergers Act. So he does have some concerns over big business and its power and influence. The biggest policy battle between the two camps, the Democrats and the Republicans, could well come on the tax front. The Democrats want to increase the corporate tax rate from 21% to about 28%. That would still leave it below the 35% level that Trump reduced it from in 2017. During his first term, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act also cut income taxes. That's back when Trump was in office the first time. But it only did that temporarily. So those corporate taxes were permanent, but the cuts to income taxes were temporary. And those tax cuts expire at the end of 2025. So without any action from Congress, those personal income tax rates for Americans will revert to their previous levels, which are higher. That is going to be a key battleground. A Trump-led regime would also look to overturn some parts of Biden's Inflation Reduction Act from 2022, while it would also look to repeal some climate and renewable energy policies. So all of these things could move around depending on who gets in. And a lot will depend on who wins Congress. It's not just about who wins the presidency, because whoever wins Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, will have much more influence. So a clean sweep would help either candidate execute their agenda. Right now, the Republicans control the House of Representatives, while the Democrats have a majority in the Senate. So you've got gridlock at the moment, which means you're not going to see quite as much dramatic change. And not so long ago, a Republican sweep, Trump in the White House and the Republicans with the Senate and the House, the clean sweep, the red wave, as some would call it, that looked quite lightly. However, with this post-Biden reset under Kamala Harris, the chances of a divided Congress have increased. It's very hard to see a Democratic clean sweep uh, eventuating. So if anything, I think you'll have a Republican clean sweep or you'll have a divided Congress. It's hard to say, but I don't think you'll see the Democrats end up with both the House and the Senate. That just looks too difficult for them. What about the areas where both sides actually agree? Well, one is concern over the growing power and influence of China. Although Trump is much more forthright in his views, the Democrats still want to de-risk this changing global dynamic. So while the rhetoric is different, I think relations between the world's two biggest economies are likely to remain tense. And presidents have a high degree of executive authority when it comes to things like tariffs and immigration, even if there's grid look in Congress. So that could put some companies that are very dependent on China at risk, maybe those that have got high revenue exposures from China, or where supply chains are quite integrated. There's also some common ground around the dominance of big tech, and that could see that sector remain under scrutiny, regardless of the election outcome. Many Democrats believe big tech has become too powerful and they harbour concerns around privacy, around the impact of social media on young people, things like that. Very valid concerns. Some Republicans are equally apprehensive and they have their own misgivings about the tech sector. Some of them believe it is anti-conservative and that it silences voices and that sort of thing. So I think big tech might find itself still in the spotlight no matter who gets in. 
So how should investors be thinking about the election? Well, let's look back at history. In the 20 elections that we've had since 1945, the US share market, and I'm basing this on the S&P 500 index, has risen on 18 occasions. So out of all of those election years, 20 of them, the market's been up 18 times. That's a pretty good hit rate, a 90% hit rate. That's actually a better hit rate than any typical year where the share market is up 75% of the time. So generally, the market shrugs off these political issues. The two election year declines came in 2000 and 2008, and both of those were around the time of US recessions. In 2000, obviously that was close to the bursting of the dot-com bubble that caused a big recession and a big decline in the US share market, and then in 2008, obviously, that was around the time of the GFC. So I think that is a very important and relevant reminder that fundamentals in terms of the economic backdrop and the earnings outlook are what matters most for the path of financial markets. Politics is important, but earnings, economics, what the Federal Reserve is doing, all of those things are more important than what you're seeing in Washington, D.C. At the same time, it would be naive to suggest investors sit on their hands completely when such major shifts in the political environment could be underway. A Trump victory with a unified Republican Congress is still very possible, if not probable. So while dramatic portfolio adjustments might not be the answer, some fine-tuning might be wise as November gets closer. It's a great time to touch base with your advisor, take a look at your portfolio, and see if you have hedged your bets and if you're diversified enough to cover yourself for any of these potential outcomes. Thanks for listening, team. We'll talk again soon. For more insights, visit craigsip.com.